Okay, welcome back to 15 Minute Truths. This is our teaching on the Song of Solomon. It's a new category, and I'm going to stay in this uh, uh, area of uh, study for a while. And there's a lot of truths here. I invite you to walk with us through the Song of Songs. Now, the Song of Solomon is a typological love cantata, revealing Christ, the Bride of Christ, the Church, and the Mother Church. It reveals all those things. It's typological. It shows typological truths that are incredibly in-depth. There have been more books written about this, uh, this uh, um, love cantata than, than I think any other book except maybe Revelations. It truly is a book of Revelations. It reveals the love relationship between Christ and the bride. It also reveals many, many other truths, and I invite you to be with us as we go through these and dig them out. There's many books, like I've said, many study books about the Song of Songs. It's, a, it's incredible. It's, it's amazing to me. It amazes me about God. Because, yes, Solomon was the wisest man, but God gave him that wisdom. He didn't have it on his own. He didn't go to university. God gave it to him. And the, the wisdom of God is seen in this book. A man could not have written this. The people would just look at it and say, oh, it's just a love story. You know, they, they totally miss the meaning of the book. <laughs> then there's others that dive in deeper and they go, oh, wow. Oh, this is a picture of Christ and the bride. And then others dive in still deeper. But I'll tell you a truth and, and, and walk with me in this. If you don't understand the nature of God and you still think he's a three-headed, multi-personality multi Godhead, and if you still think that, that the, the chief God or the father God is willing to roast his children for, uh, uh, forever, then you can't understand this book because it d does not display that God. It displays the God of love. And what does the Bible say that God is? Love. And it isn't man's love, which is conditional. It's God's love, which is unconditional. It's God's love. This is a love cantata. A cantata, that's, a, that's an Italian word. It means a song. It's a love song or a love chorus. It's meant to be sung by, by different actors and players. There's a chief actor that, that represents Solomon, and they sang this song uh, uh, every year as, as a memorial. And they sang this. This became the hit, number one hit parade song <laughs> in Israel for a long time. And somebody would sing in the part of Solomon. Somebody would sing in the part of the bride, and then a whole chorus of female uh, uh, singers would sing the chorus portion. It's a love cantata. It's the original love story. Isn't that amazing? How many of you ever watched the movie Love Story? And that, uh, and, uh, and, you know, about Romeo and Juliet, you know, and then that, that, uh, that song called Love Story, you know. Uh, it, uh, you know but this far surpasses that. The, the point of Love Story was that ruling families, ruling through their children, trying to punish each other through their children, end up in the end losing their children. And through that tragedy, it finally broke the, the, the feud between the two families so they could come together and, and be act normal again. The point in God's love story is to teach us about the depth of the love of God for his bride. The depth and the longing of the love of God for his bride who loves him like he loves her. And the difference, the separation between the church, the visible church, and the, and the, the groom the lover, the, the separation that's there because they want a hero. They want a governor. They want a king ruler. But the bride just wants the groom. The bride just wants the groom. There's a big difference. And the groom just wants somebody that will love him, not somebody that will just be a servant. Not somebody that will just be a, a hero. Not somebody that'll just be their general. Not somebody that'll just give them meat in due season. 
The groom longs for the bride that has a heart for him like he has for her. That's what this story is all about. It's the original true love story. It was written by Solomon at about 953 years before the birth of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Almost a thousand years before Christ was born. And it pictures Christ. The Father through the Son for the bride. It feels so perfect that we're here today on the first day of tabernacles. On the first day of tabernacles, we're here teaching the Song of Solomon because the true Solomon that this book typifies was born during tabernacles. And on this day, his mother Mary and his, his earthly father Joseph were in a booth made uh, out of sticks from a manger. You ever wonder, how, what does it mean that Christ was born in a manger? And on, in our old Baptist church, they always show that somehow, <laughs> uh, how is he born? How did Mary get in the manger? Because <laughs> if Christ was born in the manger, she had to be in there first. <laughs> You know, and so I never understood it. But then later on through study, I realized, oh, okay. All right. It was a booth. It was a teepee with robes thrown over it to be the outer covering to keep the, the fall dew off of them. And she lay on a, on a blanket there inside that teepee and gave birth to Christ. Isn't that amazing? And this is the day, the very day, that we're reading and studying the book that typologically points right to him and to his bride. How fitting. This book is uh, about the young Shulamite bride, the daughters of Jerusalem, and the lover, which is Christ. Now the Shulamite is somebody, it's a female that is from the town of Shulam. We see her uh, talked about in uh, chapter 6, verse 13. We know her name from 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 3. Her name is Abishag. Abishag was the last wife of King David. When David was dying, and David was, was the, the, the height, the epitome of the presence of God and the leading of God for Israel, before the, 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 the temple was built, while they were still uh, worshiping God in an, uh, before the Ark of the Covenant to attend, just like Moses did. David was their king and was the one that actually unified all the tribes and brought them together and beat the Philistines and pushed them out of the country. David was their hero and they tried to keep him alive and he was very, very old and he was failing and his body was getting cold, ready to slip into death. And they panicked they said, we can't let this happen. We can't let this happen. We need, we need somebody young. We need a, a, a young woman, a young virgin to marry him and be with him and, and lay against him and warm him. And so they looked around the land and they found the most beautiful woman that, that was in the land and her name was Abishag, a young woman from the town of Shulam. That's why she's called the Shulamite. They brought her uh, to David and she laid against him, trying to keep him warm. But he died. And so she went into the, the house or the harem, legally married. She went into the house of the harem as a virgin. And, uh, and I'm sure she was sitting there wondering, what's going to happen to me now? Well, David, by the Spirit of God, told Israel that Solomon is, is to take over after me. So instantly she realized, I will become Solomon's wife. But the devil always has a counter. He always has a plan, you see, to, to thwart the plan of God. And the devil knew that somehow this Abishag, this, this young girl, was important, and he didn't know why. But he knew that she was important, and he knew that the Spirit of God through angels were all around King Solomon. So they devised a plan we got to take the throne from Solomon. we got to stop this from happening. we got to stop the plan of God. And so they rose up Solomon's brother, Adoniah. And he started calling the captains of the hosts and the leaders of Jerusalem and saying, 
I am the oldest son, so I am the heir of the throne. And they all started gathering around him and anointing him as king. And then he demanded that he was going then to, to marry Abishag. And when this was told uh, to uh, the prophet, uh, to Nathan, that uh, this is what Adoniah had done, Solomon rose up and, and uh, uh, the prophet anointed him. They got the high priest to uh, consecrate the anointing. And then they walked him out before the people. And all the people listened to Nathan. They knew he was true and he would only speak the word of God. And he announced that this is the, the heir. This is the one the Lord has chosen. So Adoniah and his plans were thwarted. His plans were thwarted. He tried one more time to take Abishag to uh, 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 Bathsheba, Solomon's uh, mother. And uh, Solomon stopped it. And, uh, and it, it ended up in the end costing uh, uh, Adoniah his life. But the enemy tried to stop. He always does. The enemy always comes and opposes the people of God. We were opposed this morning to coming here and fulfilling the word of God. Abishag, the last wife of David, became the, the, the most loved wife of Solomon. So loved, he loved her so dearly, and she loved him with a love that, that far surpasses station. If he would have lost his kingship, she would have been just fine with that. Solomon was forced for political reasons to marry a lot of different wives of different countries to have peace with that country. That's why he had never had war uh, in, in his time. The problem with that was those wives also had the right to bring their false gods into the country. And it ended up becoming a stumbling. But Abishag of Israel was not the stumbling. She was not the stumbling. Solomon loved Abishag. And Abishag loved Solomon with all their hearts. And so the Lord anointed Solomon one day. Just like I felt that anointing come on me during Teshuvah to write those messages. The Lord anointed Solomon and he sat down and his scribe was sitting at his feet. And Solomon started, started speaking the words of this cantata. And singing part of it. And musicians were there and they wrote down notes. And it became the favored song for centuries. And we have it today. We don't remember now how it was sung. But we have the truth of it. Because what it pointed to typologically, we can see now and the Lord has revealed it. Just as he prophesied that in the last days, knowledge will increase. And this knowledge is increasing very fast. Every time we look at the word of God, it is increasing, brethren. Amen. So I just want to say, just go on just a little bit further. The name Abishag is very interesting because it means literally, my father is a wanderer. My father is a wanderer. It's Strong's number 49 in the, in the Hebrew. Now, what does it mean typologically, my father is a wanderer? Because I tell you, everything in this book is a picture and a truth. Well, here's what it means. Abishag, who typifies the bride, will have the testimony after the rapture that her father is a wanderer and wandered the entire earth to find her. The bride ministry. Every nook and cranny and place on the earth will be looked at and found by the father, sending the saints out, the bride out, to find the bride. It's the bride ministry. My father is a wanderer. Yes, he is. And he's going to wander the earth high and low, to and fro until he finds every last bride saint. And they become part of the bride until they're taken home. And then the typological Abishag will say, my father is a wanderer. And he found me in the remotest part of the earth. And he came to me there and he changed my life forever. Amen.